Hi, I'm Dr. Steven Seiler, and you're listening to this expert edition of the Physical Performance Show. Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to the Physical Performance Show brought to you by PhysioCrem and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. The aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll bring you a range of different episodes, including featured performers, coaches' corners, interest editions, and expert editions. And this week, we keep the expert edition theme flowing. If you've ever wondered how hard you should be training in terms of intensity or how long you should be structuring your endurance training sessions, then this is an episode, an expert edition you cannot afford to miss. I'm extremely excited to bring you today's guest, acclaimed sports scientist, Stephen Seiler. Dr. Stephen Seiler's name has been put forth by many show listeners over time as someone who they would love to hear from. So it's a real thrill to bring this conversation that I recently had with Dr. Seiler to you, the listener of The Physical Performance Show. Now, by way of bio, Stephen Seiler is an American sports scientist who now resides in Norway. Stephen is prolific, acclaimed worldwide amongst coaches, researchers, and athletes, and health professionals for his work into optimizing endurance training. Stephen is perhaps best known for his work on polarized training. You see, over two decades of research, Stephen and his team discovered that most endurance athletes spend the majority of their training time at very low intensities. An intensity, Stephen coins, zone one. The majority of the remaining training time is spent at high intensity or zone three. And quite surprisingly, the world's best endurance athletes, cyclists, rowers, cross-country skiers, and distance runners may spend only 4% at threshold level. Yet as recreational athletes, myself included, it is so tempting to feel like we need to make given training sessions harder than likely what is required. And it's this training intensity distribution that has become popularized largely by Dr. Steven Seiler and known worldwide as the polarized training method. In other terms, in parlance, it has been referred to as 80-20 training. Stephen has been the past Dean of Faculty of Health and Sports Sciences at the University of Agda in Norway, a former research and senior consultant for the Norwegian Olympic Federation, an executive board member of directors for the European College of Sports Science. And on today's conversation, Stephen covers some fascinating topics, including why it is that what the world's best elite endurance athletes does scales down to recreational and time-pressed athletes, why we are wise to avoid what Stephen refers to as the training intensity black hole, why we should be confident in ourselves and stick to our plan, why it may be wise to do hard workouts with others and easy workouts by ourselves, why simply training at a higher intensity may not get the results we're after, as opposed to lengthening out some of our training sessions, the concept of heart rate max and how to calculate it, as opposed to heart rate peak, how to determine what training zone you are in, zone one, two, or three, without lactate testing equipment. And I asked Stephen the worst podcasting question in history, of which Stephen then lays down his physical challenge for the week. So here is the wisdom and the many decades of scientific forefront thinking from acclaimed sports scientist, 
Dr. Stephen Seiler on all things optimizing training for peak performance and the polarized training approach. Stephen Siler, PhD, you have been a highly requested guest of the Physical Performance Show through the listeners, so welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you briefly speak to the evolution you've been on with your, your professional career? I was intrigued at one point you were working in a lab, not with humans, but in the same lab that Lance Armstrong was, I believe, doing some heat, heat testing in back in the U.S., well, that's right. So my formal education is from the United States. I did my master's at one university, the University of Arkansas, and then I moved to Austin, Texas, did my PhD there. And I was working with rats and I was doing research on rat hearts. But right next door, uh, they were doing a lot of physiological testing of cyclists. And one of those cyclists that was tested there on several occasions was a young version of Lance Armstrong. So it was an environment where we were using research models that ranged from isolated cells and organs all the way up to uh, military or athletes in heat chambers. So it was quite quite an interesting and inspiring place to work during those years I was doing my PhD. And at that point, Stephen, were you actively involved in endurance sports like you are now or how were you staying fit? Yeah, I was, uh, I had been cycling, uh, got into cycling as a rehab for an injury, started racing. So I was racing as a cyclist and then I start my PhD and very quickly discover that I just do not have time, <laughs> you know, that uh, between the hours and hours in the laboratory and the teaching I was doing as a teaching assistant. Uh, and, and at the same time, a girl in a class kept coming up to me. I was teaching this fitness class, and she kept coming up and saying, you should be a rower. And she happened to be a rather short, small girl, and it turned out she was a coxswain for the rowing team. And uh, I, at first, I brushed her off and told her, you know, leave me alone. I'm a cyclist. And then eventually, I said, well, okay, if you'll leave me alone, I'll go down. And so at 530 in the morning, one morning, I went down to the rowing club, met a guy who said, all right, I'll come back on Saturday and I'll go out with you. And long story short, started rowing and competed in rowing. And uh, that fellow I met ended up being the best man at my wedding here in Norway. What won the tug of war, the cycling or the rowing? The rowing won because I was able to train at 5.30 in the morning Okay. Uh, on the water. And it was dark, but there was less traffic on the water than there was on the roads. <laughs> so, you know, there was traffic on the water as well, as well as mean geese and different kinds of uh, swans <laughs> and things, even snakes. <laughs> but, but all in all... Turned out the water was a safer place to be at 5.30 a.m. So so I could do rowing workouts early in the morning, and then I could uh, you know, clean up, get to the lab, and, and uh, I lived in a rather Spartan existence back in the day. And, uh, I mean, it's quite nice to know that, you know, you, you really have lived your work, and you continue to live your the findings of your work professionally uh, in terms of your, your current cycling exploits, uh, which, you know, I must shout out to your feed on Twitter. It's always got some intriguing data going up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, my cycling exploits, that's a that's kind of a kind term. It's mostly on Zwift or on the in the comfort of my living room or the discomfort of my living room. Uh, so I'm not, I decided to, to not actually buy a road bike and get into the racing scene again because I know that it takes up so much time. But I can I can have fun on Zwift. I can have fun and stay fit, you know, uh, without getting too over the top. <laughs> you know, you're so well known. You've really put a stake in the ground for for coaches, athletes, uh, health professionals worldwide with your work into how endurance athletes train. Uh, how did you end up in Norway? And there's a great story I've heard you recount of you observing a young girl with a large VO2 max and known a big aerobic capacity that stopped at a hill and did something intriguing. So can you tie those two things together? Well, yeah, sure. I, uh, I was finishing up my PhD. This was back in 1994. So I was on the, on the you know, home stretch of my PhD work. 
but I was uh, tired and decided, all right, I'm going to take a little trip to a, a conference, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine conference, and and took a trip up there and just by happenstance met this Norwegian woman uh, who was at the conference. And I don't think she took a, a very clear liking to me, but I was persistent and uh in the end, a year, about a year later, a little bit more than a year later, I ended up moving to Norway and because of her. And we were married for 12 years and have two kids. And uh, so that's the short, the short reason for my coming to Norway. It's a, it's a long, there's a longer backstory, but, you know, this is a family show. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but you know the Olympics had been in Norway in '94. I knew that Scandinavia had a great reputation for exercise physiology. Uh, I was doing animal research, kind of wanted to uh, move back into human research. Then I meet this fantastic woman, so kind of the stars kind of aligned, and I made this rather radical move to uh, not do a postdoc that, you know, I could have done and, and just kind of went into the unknown and went to Norway. So then I'm in Norway, no job, not much money. <laughs> and, uh, but I had time to kind of collect my thoughts and, and think about, you know, how do I want to, what do I want to work with? And clearly given the endurance physiology background in Norway, it was not hard for me to see the possibilities. And, and then, Connecting to that story you like, uh, you know, we had a little laboratory in this in this early uh, version of where we are now as a sports science facility, and there was this woman who we had tested recently, and her her sister was a silver medalist in the Olympics in cross country skiing. She was not quite as good as her sister, or didn't have quite the the resume, but she was very solid and like, you know, like I've said before, had a very good uh, motor, you know, had a good oxygen consumption or maximum oxygen consumption. And then I happened to see her out in the forest. There was nice forest trails around where I live and I see her running and then suddenly stopping at a steep hill and walking uh, swiftly up the hill. And that really struck me. Uh, I thought, my goodness, you know, because I would have run up that hill, you know, <laughs> never met a hill I didn't want to <laughs> accelerate up, you know, <laughs> but, but she didn't. She walked up the hill and then as soon as she got to the top, she resumed her running speed. And, and long story short, this was kind of an eye opener because it revealed something that ended up being, I think, really important down the road, and that was this issue of that when when good endurance athletes train and have a plan to do a low intensity, long endurance session, they have they need to have the discipline to stick to it and don't be like a dog chasing a squirrel, you know, <laughs> every time the squirrel comes into view that you suddenly take off running <laughs> or increase the you know increase your pace or increase your intensity and then before you know it that long endurance ride that was supposed to be below the stress radar is not it, it becomes you know a, a fairly hard medium intensity session and so this was just a kind of an eye opener that uh, years of research has gone on to confirm in a more quantitative way the importance of that intensity discipline. Yeah, and I love that that phraseology, the intensity discipline. And, and Stephen, I'm putting my hand up here that I am a recovering zone two abuser. Uh, as an endurance athlete, I think I've had the better part of 20 years of endurance sports uh, stuck in the middle, thinking that more intensity was better when I'm under time constraints. Well, and you and I've done it, you've done it. Trust me, one of the one of the things I can say with my hand over my heart is that any mistake that I talk about in this training optimization discussion, any mistake you can make, I have made. Uh, particularly when I was younger, I, I've looked back, thought back, and thought, my goodness, I, I really did things wrong, you know. <laughs> and, and I still ended up having decent fun, I, but I know that I overdid it. I know I cooked myself on many occasions and, and during many training periods. Uh, and so if I could ever go back and do something different, it would just to be to have like one year 
as a 28 year old doing things right. Um, so, but, but that's, and that's the thing is that one of the really nice surprises with all this research that I've done is that knowing and understanding what high performance athletes do to bring success scales down to regular people, to amateurs, to age group athletes. It scales down. It works. The opposite is not true. That is that lots of research on untrained people or moderately trained people doesn't tell us how to get to the top. There are big differences. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, trans, a transferability from what you observed in you know the cohort of elite performers doing uh, this disciplined young lady, the Norwegian girl with the big VO2 max walking up that hill. Uh, you know, it, it scales down, as you say. So recreational athletes, beginners, recreationally competitive athletes, we can look and learn from the best as to how they distribute their training intensities. Yeah, and, and the most common question that I have received over the last few years is, well, yeah, that works for, for athletes doing 20 hours plus a week, but I only do five or seven. Uh, surely I should just work hard every day. And... And I get that, but the, the fact is, no, that's not true. That that also those of us who are only training, you know, I'm in, I'm in that area, eight hours a week, and uh, if I try to train threshold level every all those workouts, I get cooked. You know, it, I know even just going a little bit too much too hard for me, and and I feel it. But if I am disciplined and I keep my easy sessions where they belong, then I actually look forward to the hard sessions and get the chance to kind of, you know, push on the accelerator and test my wings. And and that then, you know, you're kind of in the right balance. And time after time, I've gotten feedback from age group athletes and amateurs that, that say, yes, this made a difference. It helped. It took me a couple months, uh, but I'm better now. So I... I know it works. And do you think it's mainly driven the mistakes that so many athletes make, as we alluded to, we, I've made them, you've made them, is because of those time constraints when, if people aren't professional that they fear that if they don't have the intensity in there, they won't get the gains. Uh, is it driven by fear or is it? what do you think are the underlying drivers for why, despite a growing awareness of you know this phrase that you've coined, the polarised training, uh, being more more known, I believe, worldwide. What do you think drives the behaviors of people to, as we'll elaborate on in a moment, get stuck in that zone two middle? Well, I think it's just human nature. It's, and I still struggle with it to this day. If I'm on Swift and someone cycles by me, you know, the temptation, there's always that initial reflex to jump on their wheel uh, or try to ride past them again, you know. Uh, even though I have told myself, look, you're going to go 200 watts for two hours today, be a good, you know, be smart, uh, do what, practice what you preach. Those, those temptations are still there. And I think it's just, we have a tendency to accelerate or push the pressure because we can, uh, you know, and then unfortunately we keep doing that and then we get to those hard sessions and then suddenly it's not there, you know, and so I used to I used to call this a training intensity black hole, where the intensity of your workouts gets kind of sucked in towards the middle. You go harder on easy days because you can, and then you end up going a bit slower on hard days because you're you're fatigued, and so things move towards the middle, and that is precisely what the best athletes are able to. Avoid. And I've heard you say, Stephen, that the mentality is they have this discipline, but you know, as you say, it's hard to let someone ride past you on Swift. Yet the elites will let people run past them, and you know, as you alluded to, they have a plan and they work that plan and they stick to it, and then they let their numbers do the talking on race day. Yeah, I think that's you know a worthwhile kind of thing we can work on is just have self confidence. You know, be confident in yourself, be confident in your plan. And smile when the rider goes by you. You know, that's that may be their hard day, or they may be thrilled to be riding past you. Let them enjoy it. Uh, if you know, you know what you're good for. 
And, and I think that if you can learn to be magnanimous, you know, and at the same time, no, hey, come back tomorrow because tomorrow is my hard day, then then I think you'll end up being a better athlete, but also, uh, I think, a better athlete to ride with, you know, because it's it's tough to always ride with people that are competing every workout or work, you know, ride, run, whatever. You know, there's a tendency, if you fall into this situation where the people you're training with make every workout a competition, then they're probably not the best people for you to train with. Yeah, and uh, it's it's difficult and I often joke that if you want a recipe for racing, put a bunch of uh, of guys or girls on bikes and let them loose and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, so I, I have uh, sometimes said that, you know, do hard workouts with a group, do easy workouts alone. Oh. Uh, you know, that often, like, even me, if I'm on Zwift, I tend to not do group rides. I've tried them more in the last few weeks, but they tend to just accelerate out of control. So if I really know I need to be in a certain zone, I just go alone, and then I'm in control. And then I'm not tempted, you know, by all these, uh, by all the squirrels running by, as they say, you know. And so uh, that's, you know, you just need to figure out your own personality, what works for you. Uh, and, but sometimes it's a good idea to do the high quality hard sessions with a certain group that you you're, you know that has the right uh, capacity for you, and then occasionally just you know go it alone or go it with somebody that you really are able to to work with and it's at the same level. Yeah, great advice, Stephen. Uh, along with the observation of that young lady walking the hill uh, around that time, I believe. You know, you were in contact with a Norwegian legendary Olympic coach uh, who commented that he didn't like pushing his athletes too much around, you know, what we'd sort of loosely know as the anaerobic threshold because he felt that it was, it was too much pain for too little gain to go above that too often. Can you speak to that and then that how seated, you know, this uh, exploration into more of a, the training intensity work you've done? Yeah, well... Way back then, the, the person you referred to was the national team coach for the cross-country ski team of, of Norway. And, and on that team, there were athletes that were legends uh, in the sport and, and kind of legends in physiological circles because of their very high VO2 max values. And, and so when he said this, he actually said it in the Norwegian press you know, well, we don't do too much, you know, threshold training because it's too little, too little gain for too much pain. It was kind of, that was, he phrased it like that. And, and that really struck me because I had come from the United States where it was almost the, the standard model was to find your lactate threshold and then spend a lot of time there. And again, this was based on research on untrained people where you, you know, if you want to go from sofa to able to run a 10K, then 45-minute runs around your threshold is, is a fairly effective recipe. And it'll probably get you where you want to be, where you can at least handle a 10K in six to eight weeks. Uh, and so that's kind of the <laughs> – that's a very typical way of thinking. So this this coach, he challenged my conventional wisdom on that, and that – kind of was part of the impetus for me to say, hmm, they're doing something right, so let me understand this. And then that's when I started really trying to collect data on how the athletes were actually trained. And, and then from there, I should say, from there we then went into the lab and tried to pursue the questions more under controlled circumstances. And was that around this sort of time that you were reviewing the training habits of the African marathoners as well? That's right. So, it, you know, I was asked to review a, a manuscript by a, a, a well-known French exercise physiologist named Bilal or, or Bial. And um, she was, she had access to the training of these very good uh, runners she was focused on high intensity. She was like many physiologists. She was, you know, enamored by interval training uh, because it's fun to it's fun to play with in the laboratory. Uh, I got to be honest, you know. <laughs> uh, but when I looked at her data, what struck me was is that you know eighty percent of the kilometers these these elite runners were doing were well below marathon pace, and then only four percent were at marathon pace, and they were marathoners. 
And then the rest were like more uh, 5K, 10K pace, you know, interval sessions. And so that's one of the places where I started seeing this kind of polarization or this Nike swoosh that we drew ultimately in a paper show suggesting that, you know, there's a lot of volume at low intensity, you know, low is relative, but low for these athletes, you know, a fairly limited amount at, at threshold or middle intensity, and then a, a significant portion at high intensity. And so that, you know, again, you're kind of, these, these are the different things that started lining up for me. And not too long after that, and we had collected some data on really good junior skiers, that's when I ended up presenting and proposing the so-called polarized training model. And when you did first present it, was there much pushback or was there a, you know, a, yeah. a, a, a flowing level of acceptance? What was the original uh, uh, amongst your peers response? You know, there were some that seemed to see it. They kind of, mm, this is interesting. I remember Carl Foster he, he was a guy who had kind of discovered me when I was writing a, a, a web page, and he, he understood it. So he invited me to speak at a big at a, at a kind of a symposium that was put on by the United States Speed Skating Association. Uh, this was after the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City. So there I get asked by a Dutch speed skating uh, program to work with their elite athletes. So they seemed to, you know, they tapped into it right away. Then in 2004, I remember I was giving a kind of a symposium lecture in France uh, as part of a something called the European College of Sports Science uh, Conference. And I can remember being the crowd, the coaches were nodding affirmatively at what I was saying. But the sports scientists were kind of like nodding negatively, like that, that can't be right. And so at that point, it was very interesting because people who had worked with elite athletes, they saw it and they got it. But people who had not worked with elite athletes, they, people who had only been in the lab with regular people, you know, untrained or moderately trained, they didn't get it. They didn't see it. They didn't agree. That was, you know, now that's 15 years ago. Uh, I have to say today that I don't get that pushback. Hmm. And the, the evidence base to support what you observed all those years ago, you know, 15 plus years ago, more now, I guess, uh, is large. I mean, uh, can you point to some of the uh, more recent literature around the support for the polarized training method? Well, you know, the way we pursued it, and, and we're not alone, but, but I guess we started it, uh, you know, we started by just uh, describing as accurately as possible the training of very well-trained athletes. You know, the, the, from junior, elite junior cross-country skiers to gold medal winning skiers, then there were German cyclists, there were Norwegian and German rowers. You know, so I've, I've had access to different groups, runners. Uh, so, so we kind of built up a fairly good descriptive base that demonstrated that it wasn't just rowing, it wasn't just cross-country skiing. It seemed to be there were some universal um, similarities in, in the way these good athletes were self-organizing, the, the, the distribution that they were choosing. Um, the key similarity was as they were doing a lot of low-intensity work. And then we said, okay, let's, you know, pursue some of these sub-questions in the laboratory with uh, a group that will let us manipulate their training. Because you, you don't get elite athletes, they're not going to be experimental test rabbits. Uh, they'll let you measure them, but they don't let you change what they're doing very often. And so we would, we would generate hypotheses from the descriptive studies, and then we would do some experimental studies uh, with... Uh, amateurs, age groupers, and so forth. And then that's when we started seeing, hey, these principles work. They, they help improve the performance of athletes that are only training maybe a, you know, a third of the, the volume that the, the elite are. So as you say, the findings scale down. And uh, are there any favorite stories of, tra- of changing someone's, uh, you know, through the perhaps you work with the Norwegian Olympic uh, Federation, et cetera, there where you've seen is there a real memorable uh, success story of yours, Stephen, where you've seen someone adopt the polarized training 
ideal or method, I guess, and uh, achieve success? Well, i got to be honest with you. I, I've been very fortunate to receive some wonderful emails from different people around the world that have, you know, said things, told me things about their story. One of the uh, I wish I had. I wish I had it in front of me. I could quote it, but I remember one time receiving this email uh, from someone who had con- contacted me via Twitter or something, and then he he just wrote, "Hey, while I have your attention, I just want to say I'm a coach of juniors and, and you know and high school athletes and so forth, and your work has made it possible for athletes to get college scholarships to do things they didn't think were possible." Uh, and, and that, you know, he, he, he phrased it in such a beautiful way and it just was so, uh, it made it all worthwhile. You know, he, the, 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 the currency of scientists is publications, but, uh, in the world of sports science, you really do have the opportunity to at least try to influence best practice in a, in a positive way. And, and getting that kind of feedback from coaches of young athletes, I think, has particularly been uh, really rewarding to me. Because, unfortunately, I do think there is kind of an epidemic of misuse and abuse of various, you know, this high-intensity, get good as fast as you can training approach with young athletes. Um, it's partly just driven by the pursuit of college scholarships and, you know, things like that. But if, if I've done anything that has tried to, you know, keep some junior athletes, uh, on the right path and make it sustainable for them so that they can actually develop over time, then that's probably been the, the best outcome for me. Yeah. So rewarding a contribution like that outside, as you say, the, uh, the currency of a scientist, which is, uh, publications, Stephen, uh, on the junior talent talent development uh, theme, I heard you reference something that I found really profound, and and that is that you know when we are training for an endurance event, we need to consider the number of sessions over time. You know, over a year, if we train five times a week, you know that's two hundred and fifty sessions a year. Yet, I think the human tendency, or maybe it's just a, a junior developmental thing, is. We can't seem to see beyond beyond the end of our fingertips that day, that week's training volume, etc. So, can you speak a little bit to the wisdom in taking that stretched out view and some of your observations and anecdotes from looking at the practices of some of the world's best best athletes with regards to this mindset? Uh, absolutely, you know, it is fun, and I think Michael Joyner he talked about a, the you know the, the twenty times four hundred meter workout. It's one of the the hallmark rites of passage, excuse me, rites of passage of the, you know, endurance athlete or middle distance track athlete, and so he got me onto this issue of you know the the epic workout, and those are fun or not fun, but they are memorable and they break barriers perhaps, and they are certainly uh, good conversation, uh, uh, you know, starters, but. They're not what makes champions champions. When you talk to elite athletes and say, what has made you good? They've said, it's been the slow grind, doing the daily grind exceptionally well. Um, Shalane O'Flanagan, uh, I believe is her name, that she won the New York City Marathon a couple years back. She wrote one time on a Twitter, she said, I try to do ordinary workouts or no she said i'm sorry she said uh even when i'm doing ordinary training i'm preparing for something extraordinary i think that's what we have to keep in mind is that the great performances those pbs you said in a 10k or a marathon or a half you know a, a triathlon they are the result of the last 200 training sessions not the last hard interval session. And when you have that perspective, then you begin to think about sustainability. Then you begin to think about, if I go so hard on this session that I have to recover for three days after and I miss two quality sessions, you know, then you start to see how the math actually works. And the math works by sustainably integrating 
hard sessions with low intensity sessions over time so that the total work that you're doing, the total stimuli that you're creating for adaptation is optimized or, or maximized within your constraints. And a lot of that is through those just regular, you know, 90 minute runs in the forest at low intensity. That is an incredibly important part of the success recipe. Yeah, gosh. And it makes me think of one of Australia's 1500 meter runners, Stephen, who on one of his featured performer episodes of the show, he commented that every session through his eyes, Ryan Gregson, he views as a building block. Every session is just a building block for the next one, for the next one, for the next one. So I guess it's, it's similar to that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, it, you know, that we can't look at these sessions in isolation. It is, you know, the body is just, we're creating, we're developing uh, this biological durability that I, we've talked about. It, that wasn't a phrase that I invented. It was one I saw one time and it just fits so well. We're, we're building a body that, that tolerates the stresses of, of a high intensity endurance performance and we're building it over time. And races are opportunities to turn on the machinery and push it to the max. But the machinery is built over, you know, the, the daily grind of workouts, whether it's four sessions a week or 14. Uh, that's where the work is done. So it's a mistake to over-attribute importance to the soul session at the neglect of the bigger picture, the many sessions over a year, over a, a career, over a, a training block. Yeah, I mean, even if you take a fairly short perspective and say, well, my current fitness is is a consequence of the last 42 days worth of training. You know, that's a typical, that's like a training peaks. I think they use a, a, a six-week window. Well, that's 42 days. If I'm training five to six days a week, even that short window is about is, is over 30 sessions. And so that huge one massive interval session I did is what, 3% of that? You know, so and then if I look over really a more realistic window for my performance, the whole season or a year, then suddenly that one workout is a drop in the ocean. It is, you know, of, of total training that I that I have done, the stimuli that I have created to create the body that I am bringing to the starting line. And I heard you mention that, uh, for example, I think cross-country skiers, I think they knew that they had to have X amount of sessions done per year. And of those, it might have been 500 a year, and of those, X amount needed to be an intensity. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, they, they, the cross-country skiers in Norway, there's just some kind of rules of thumb. And, and, and you got to realize, obviously, there's individualization around this. But they'll typically say, look, if we're going to have a successful season, we need to get about 100 hard sessions in, uh, in, you know, in the course of the season. And then if you think that, well, 100 sessions is 20% of the total, or less than they're up at 500 total sessions. Now, some of them are, are higher than that, maybe between 500 and 600 sessions. And 100 to 115 of them or so will be hard. So that they, they just kind of, you know, it's one of those things that's interesting is that when right now it's, what is it, we're in July, This is this is money time for, uh, elite cross-country skiers in Norway. This is when they are baking the cake, you know, getting ready for the season. They need to be, they're very concerned about staying healthy, getting the training in. This is when they're doing their biggest volumes, July, August, September. Uh, and if they, for whatever reason, don't get, you know, don't have a successful period now, they often don't have a successful season six months later. It's uh, And that phrase you use, baking the cake, I mean, I, I think it's just fantastic. So just to be clear, that's, you know, accumulating the time, doing the, the low intensity work uh, and getting ready for what I've heard you then reference is to eat the cake come competition time. Or is it eating the cake, doing the high intensity work 
as well as again the this is not my language it's not my invention the baking <laughs> the cake and the eating the cake are norwegian or my translation of norwegian <laughs> experience uh, but but that's what they will say is you know you you make the cake with you know just the daily grind the low intensity work but when we do those really hard sessions when we do races we we eat the cake you know in other words it's a high stress and there needs to be balance between the the volume the low intensity work and those very high intensity sessions races are are of course in the big picture also training they're part of the training process particularly if you're an athlete that competes you know 30 40 times a season or more cyclists are up in 80 you know uh, competitions in a season so their races are clearly part of their training and and they have to balance uh, fundamentally they have to balance the amount of time they're spending where the stress responses of the body are very limited and then those sessions where they trigger this big uh, hormonal stress response this big autonomic stress response because we can't do that every day that is a wonderful recipe for overtraining if that's the goal <laughs> you know if you want a recipe for how to overtrain a horse or a human uh, you know any research that we've seen the way you overtrain humans is just have them do medium hard work every day for a few weeks and they will get cooked. And when, and you know, as my work as a sports physiotherapist here in Australia, Steve and I see training errors so often as a leading contributing factor to the onset of injury, musculoskeletal injury, bone stress injury, or tendon injury. Uh, so I think of getting cooked in the musculoskeletal senses, but what are some of the, you know, the byproducts of getting cooked physiologically? Stephen? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, uh, let's start by by going the opposite direction and saying, what does it look like when you're you're well adapted? Then you will see that, for example, something like resting heart rate, uh, heart rate variability, those things will indicate that when you, when the athlete is at rest, they've got a nice low resting heart rate for whatever their low is. They are relaxed. They are you might call it parasympathetically dominated, but then they have the ability to mobilize. And if we do a really hard interval session, they are able to reach their maximum heart rate, they're able to reach a high peak lactate for for them. So they have this scope, uh, a really nice scope between their resting level and their maximum level. And then what happens if they get overreached or, or start you know, getting cooked, to use that term, is that that scope narrows. Now the resting, you know, and low intensity work feels harder. Resting heart rate is sliding upward. Heart rate variability is going down. And when we try to get them, you know, when we try to mobilize that higher end performance, they're missing a gear. They're not, they'll often say, I can't get the last five beats of my heart rate out. I can't mobilize. Peak lactate may actually go down. And so then you see in the, the, the scope from rest to max is narrowing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the bandwidth, they, you know, your words scientifically, they, they can't mobilize as well uh, in terms of uh, the response to the training. And the, and the chief driver for this, you know, uh, f- just to be clear, is is too much time in this messy middle zone too. Is that right? The stagnating with the, the same... That's correct. That's correct. It seems that, you know, and in, in, in if we were to go in the lab and measure your blood lactate responses and, and do a lactate profile, uh, I'm going to do that on my daughter tomorrow... And if we could at the same time measure adrenaline or epinephrine is the other term for it, measure cortisol responses, these are stress hormones, we would see that these stress hormones will track very nicely with blood lactate concentration. So in other words, if you're at low intensity and and blood lactate is basically not changing, it's staying low, then you can be pretty darn sure that that's also the case for the stress hormones. 
But as soon as you start to see that blood lactate response, you can also be pretty darn sure that you're getting a stress response from this this endocrine system and the, the, the autonomic nervous system is kicking in. And so if you do that every day, if you turn on that system every day or you know regularly with this moderate to high intensity training, or if you're doing a tour de France, you know, you happen to be an elite athlete and you're one of the poor guys that has to, you know, go get water bottles the whole race and you're working your hind end off for five hours every day. Well, you're going to find out that at the end of the tour, your maximum heart rate has gone down 15 to 20 beats. Now, why is that? You haven't aged 15 years, although it may feel like it. <laughs> but what you have done is you have lost, your body has started to downregulate the, the autonomic response. It's, you could almost argue that it's a protective mechanism, that the sensitivity of the of the receptors for the, the adrenaline and noradrenaline are, are down-regulating. And so the body kind of goes into this state where it's, it's less sensitive to uh, the mobilizing stress response. And it, and it does, you don't get the same response. Well, that's not very, that's not a good place to be if you're an elite athlete. And so, you know, what's going to happen after a tour is these guys are going to recover. They're, you know, they, they will recover. But after three weeks of that kind of load, uh, particularly if they are the, the guys in the peloton that are the, you know, the helpers, they need time to recover because they've been doing basically an overreaching protocol for three weeks. And how much time, you know, would they need to recover, Stephen? You've worked with, with uh, you know, some of these athletes. You know, it's obviously going to be variable depending on the on the athlete. But in general, you know, do they back off then for one month or, you know, what do you see and, and observe? Well, uh, they're, they're really well-trained guys and they, they've got such biological durability. So I would say those athletes, they're going to be pretty good to go again, you know, in 10, 14 days. Um, and, and it may even be that they're racing a week later, but they're not going all out. You know, I, I've seen, we've had races with where some of the, the tour riders will show up and they're almost staged events, you know, a week or 10 days later. Uh, and they're not going all out, you know, they're kind of, it's, they're playing for the audience. Uh, so how, how, you know, if we were to test them and see what is their maximum capacity and how long does it take to get up, get back to their true pre-tour max? I, I, that would be a good question. I, I would guess it might take make a, take them a couple of weeks. Yeah, and you know we're talking about the, the top end of town and elite performance, but for those recreational athletes, Stephen, getting stuck in the middle there with that moderate to hard over distribution of, uh, of that training, then uh, that training intensity, then I guess they they just don't improve or they stagnate and get frustrated and throw their hands in the air? Yeah, I think it's more along those lines. I, I don't think you're going to see what we would tr truly call overtraining. You know, that that's a pretty severe physiological state to go into. And I don't think we'll see that so often with recreational athletes, but they do stagnate. They just, that's the problem is that, let's be honest, I, I'm trying to get some data to, to really put numbers to this, but my general impression is, is that when people take off on a, a mission to, to do a 10, you know, a, to see how fast they can become in a 10 K or do their first triathlon or so forth, their, their improvement period is generally about a year at best. And then they stagnate. And for some it's less, but it's pretty amazing how short the improvement window is. And I think the reason that tends to be is just because of uh, overuse of high intensity or threshold work. You kind of, that, you know, you hit, you hit the wall in terms of what you can do with that and how much additional scope you can generate for adaptation with that. And so that's why I tend to say, look, if you want to get better, you tend to, you, the first thing you look to is train more, not harder, but just train more uh, and make your long sessions longer. Uh, that's one of the things that I think 
uh, you know, the, the age groupers, because they're time pressed, they tend to do a lot of workouts that are in that hour range. And that's probably not, a, that's not long enough. Yeah. So if you've got a time press person that can devote, say, four to eight hours of training, uh, whether it's multi sport, triathlon, or or running, and I want to refer to your daughter in a moment, Stephen, with the half marathon uh, training. But, you know, what might be your advice to that? The full time worker, four to eight hours a week, how might they, within the week, distribute their sessions? Yeah, so I, I've gone into this little game before, but, and if you're, you know, you, you say, look, I got this many hours, let's say it's, I don't know, seven, and, and if I go over that, my husband divorces me. <laughs> or, or, you know, you know they, they've already said, this is it, buddy. You know? <laughs> and so then, so that's a hard, that that's a hard, you know, a hard ball, a hard number they've got to stick to. How do I get better? low intensity stimulate out of that when I'm restricted. So my, my answer would be, well, you know, welcome to, to life as a, as a, you know, a family man or woman. (laughs) Uh, But then I would say, why don't we do this? I think I can make your partner happy and I can improve your performance within that scope. If you will let me shift around your training a bit. So now instead of what you would probably typically do, that, that seven hour a week athlete would typically do, you know, five sessions a week, trying to do as much as they can or maybe even six. And well, what ends up happening, all of those end up being what? About an hour long, right? An hour to 75 minutes. That's effective. It adds up to seven hours. They're training almost every day. Seems, seems reasonable. But the problem with that is, is that those low intensity long sessions, you really need about an hour to get up to, you know, some some kind of important physiological milestones in terms of fat mobilization and so forth. And so every time that athlete's getting where they really would get some additional value, they're having to pack it in for the day, right? So I would say, look, Instead of six sessions a week, I'm going to I'm going to make your partner happy and you're only going to train five or even four. But I hope they will let you make a couple of those sessions longer. And so we're going to I'm going to turn a couple of your long sessions into two hour sessions instead of one hour. And then I'm going to give you the day off in between. An extra day off, Stephen. But doesn't that mean I'm training less and that's going to affect my performance? But you got the same volume. You know, we said that we're, we're holding that constant, but we're moving it around. But what I'm doing now is I'm actually using my physiological brain and saying, look, if you are regularly doing one hour low intensity rides, then that is that is a stimulus that your body is comfortable with. It's no longer a, a stimulus that induces an additional adaptation. So. I need to extend the time of those low intensity sessions to move you into a a situation where your body is starting to feel a bit uncomfortable with that stimulant. Because let's, let's be honest, low intensity is only, you know, every workout is a, is a product of intensity and duration, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. We focus on intensity. But if you're running at 70% of max for two hours versus one hour, I promise you there's a big difference in terms of how that second hour feels. Why is that true? Well, because there will be some uh, fatigue of the muscle fibers that are doing that work. The brain will have to recruit additional fibers. There will be a depletion of glycogen, which is going to also stimulate additional fibers. There will be an increase in fat utilization. So there's a lot of things happening. We're not really in a steady state ever uh, during training. And so I can use that. And I can, as a coach, I'm going to use that with my athlete to, to say, look, when you do the first hour, you create conditions for the second hour to be very, very, adaptive does that make sense yeah absolutely uh absolutely and i saw a recent tweet where you were commenting on one of the 20, 2019 tour de france stage victories uh where the athlete had done the five hours of work for the final 
you know, the final uh, run home or sprint home, I guess. Uh, but they had to get to that fifth hour with, I guess, good metabolic control to have the bickies left in the bank at the end. Well, the, the guy that just took the eighth stage was a guy named Thomas de Gant, and, and he, he's Flemish, and he, he averaged 317 watts on the bike for five hours, <laughs> which in itself is impressive. But he, he, in the course of those five hours, he accumulated an hour at over 400 watts, you know, on hills and various breaks and so forth, and had to recover from that along the way. So it just shows you the amazing durability of these elite performers and how hard they can go for such a long time. Uh, and, and we just want to take a little bit of that. And, and move it over into the age grouper world and start thinking about stretching workouts and, and, and being satisfied and, and happy with being able to say, you know what, today I ran for 90 minutes at the speed I normally only run for 45. You know, I, I've extended my fitness. I've extended my uh, durability and that is going to create a wonderful platform for those higher intensity sessions and when you put those two together they start to play off of each other and before you know it you've got a new 10k APR. You're listening to acclaimed sports scientist, Dr. Stephen Seiler, sharing around optimizing training and the polarized training approach. Today's episode is brought to you by Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. And its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocram can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist or health store, as well as the online store. Physiocram have offered a 20% discount to listeners of the Physica Performance Show. Simply use the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O, when you shop at physiocram.com.au. That's F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au to redeem this offer. Hurting Sucks and Physiocram have got your back. Today's episode is also brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross the physio finish line. Our philosophy is simple. We do not want to see you for a single session more than what you need or a single session less. We would like to ensure that every client gets back to their best and across that physio finish line. To find out more about Pogo Physio's unique and award-winning services or to schedule your one-hour initial appointment, including the option to do telehealth consultations from anywhere within Australia or worldwide, jump over to Pogo Physio. .com.au. For now, let's jump back on this expert edition with acclaimed sports scientist, Dr. Stephen Seiler, on all things polarized training. And to go back to basic physiology, Stephen, you've said that you know stress placed on the body is not just about intensity, it's about duration also. We want to sometimes stretch that duration out. Uh, one session, one week, 12 weeks, organizing, you know, these sessions over these time courses. What advice would you give to people out there looking to pursue their best around, you know, a 12-week cycle? And is it important? Uh, what does the literature inform us of? Well, we, we've done, we actually did a study that was 12 weeks long and we broke it up into three, four week phases or uh, you know, cycles and we tested at the end of each of those and we did some hormone sampling and so forth. And what we found, and I think it's pretty consistent with what you see, is that if, if you think 12 weeks, most of the adaptation happens in the first four. Uh, partly because we tend to stagnate, we tend to keep doing the same things, and, and so it's hard to get 
further adaptation, partly because intensity has a pretty rapid effect. So when you do some interval training, you get a pretty rapid impact. Uh, so you need to kind of, what should I say, create some ebb and flow in your training, even over 12 weeks, it's easy to stagnate. And so if I were talking to someone that they're, they say they're 12 weeks out, then I would try to probably look at that and say, all right, let's think about what we want to achieve in the first four weeks. And then let's, let's think about a, a kind of a down phase where you, you know, catch your breath and then we're going to have a new cycle or a mini cycle so that we break the 12 weeks up into little smaller chunks that are manageable and then have some milestones in them. Otherwise, 12 weeks ends up being a pretty long time. Uh, to keep focused and keep doing the same interval sessions each week, I would definitely not recommend that. Uh, for example, if I, if you're the coach and you're programming some interval sessions for your clients, then I would say let's you know use the same session for three to four weeks max and let them compare with the previous session. That seems to work pretty well. But after about three weeks, maybe four then switch it up. So change those high intensity sessions across that say 12 week preparation phase rather than leaving them the same. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's different ways to do it, you know, but, but we got to keep it interesting. And, and again, I think one of the other things I've said quite a bit is look, this is not rocket science. There's no magic here. So you don't have to be worried about saying, well, I got to get it exactly right. I got to do the right prescription. Is it six times three minutes or is it three times six minutes? Or is it, you know, it actually isn't that critical. What does seem to be pretty important is the total number of minutes you accumulate in an interval session. That That is a worthwhile uh, target to have in mind. And then the intensity that you're working at, kind of the average or the the peak of each interval bout to have an idea of where you want that to be. How hard do you want hard to be? Um, my, my daughter is a reasonable example there is that I have, um, we, we, her favorite session is, is four times eight. Actually, she likes to go five times eight minutes. Uh, and she, you know, that's 40 minutes of work. And, and in general, when I prescribe four or five times eight minutes, that will put the athlete, you know, by the end, they'll be averaging about 92% of heart rate max uh, at the end of each interval. But my daughter is just not afraid to go deep into the cellar. You know? yeah. and, and so she ends up being in zone five for a big chunk of this, meaning she's up at 94, 95, 97% of max towards the end of these sessions. So she's, it's, it's too hard. She's working too hard. And so we had to realize that just giving her that prescription was, was not keeping her in the right intensity because she could push it just too darn hard. And so I backed it off. And now, you know, we're actually right now in the summer because races are far away. I say, look, I do not want you to go out of zone four in these sessions, you know, and, and she's collecting the minutes in zone four, not going up into that highest zone, and she recovers so much faster. She feels so much better the next day. Which is, I guess, aiding that concept of building your daughter's biological durability, right? Sustainable. Yeah, make it sustainable. That's exactly right. Is is in, in, in combination with that, she's increasing her low intensity volume. So she's doing more low intensity running. She's doing, she's for the first time now doing some double sessions on certain days. So two, two sessions a day. So we're really, she's really learning what she can tolerate and she can tolerate quite a bit of volume as long as she doesn't do the high intensity too hard, you know, and her running speed is getting better. She's just, you know, uh, I could give you some examples, but, but, it's really going well for her right now. And what she's doing is, pol you might say, polarizing even more, just more low intensity, and but also keeping those hardest interval sessions, uh, not letting them get too hard. Yeah, so it's uh, there's that little bit to hold back on, I guess. Uh, and I've heard you reference your own one hour of power time trial on the bike where you've, you know, I've heard you recount that if you can, 
just stick around 90% for the first 20 minutes. You'll, you'll, you'll probably ride a whole lot better across with your power output that 60 minutes and if you hit 95, 97% too early. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, would, I know at least in my case, if I were at 95% heart rate at, after 20 minutes, there's no way in, in uh, heck I would be able to hold that power for 60. Yeah. I mean, I'd be by 30. But if I'm at 90% after 20 minutes, then I then I've shown myself that I I can hang on for the next forty, you know, on, by the skin of my teeth. And I guess it's liberating to know in prescribing the high intensity work, it's more about as you say accumulating those minutes in that zone as opposed to the prescription. People being worried about is it four by ten or five by eight? Uh, it's just accumulate those minutes at that zone and uh, and hopefully reap the rewards. But to calculate the minutes to reverse engineer it Stephen is that looking at the total minutes across a week how might someone sort of calculate the time that they want to accumulate in the you know in a, in a three zone model in that zone three above the threshold well I, I tend to think in terms of sessions that you know in general you know we're going to create some anchor sessions like if I'm working with my daughter as an example I, I think it's re- representative we've kind of agreed that Two sessions, two hard sessions a week is what she is good for right now. That's We don't want to do more than that. Then we say, well, where do we want those? Okay, let's have them Tuesday, Friday. That gives it kind of a maximum separation and so forth. And then we fill in the rest with the the, the low intensity stuff, the lit, L-I-T, you know. So, And I use colors. Green is low intensity and yellow is, is threshold and red is high intensity. So we color code it. And if she's going to do two hard sessions where she's going to accumulate 30 minutes or so, then that's 60 minutes of hard work. And if that's going to be... You know, if those two sessions are going to be balanced probably against a good eight hours of low intensity running, you know, or even a little bit more. So right now, for example, in the last three weeks, she's averaged 140 kilometers per week of running. Um, What's that about? You divide about 1.6 and you get miles. But and that's a lot. I mean, that's a pretty big increase for her. But she's really handling it well because she's also keeping the, the high intensity under control, being very careful. So we really only have one hard interval session, you know, that really is, you know, the typical four times eight. We're only doing one of those a week right now. And then she has one session that's more speed, speed and power. And with that, she can handle a high volume. And, and so this is what we're building. We're baking the cake right now. You know, back to that expression. And baking a big cake too, hey? Eh? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'll give you an example. She went out the other day. This announced maybe 10 days ago, and I was out of the country on a conference, and all of a sudden I get this tweet or, no, this uh, message on Messenger, and it says, hey, Papa, uh, you know, I, I know I was going to do the, the five times eight minute, but I did the first eight minutes, and it felt good, so I kept going to 12 and still felt good, and, so then I just decided to do 5K at that speed, and, well, good grief, that felt great. So then I just decided to do a 10K, <laughs> and, and she was on the track. And so, Papa, I did 35.30 for 10K, you know, on the track. She just ran, you know, she was supposed to do an interval session, but she just took off running and did, <laughs> set a PB for 10K, you know, during her interval session. And so I thought, okay kiddo you're you're obviously fit <laughs> don't do that again but but well done you know? <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> brilliant well and it makes me think you've you mentioned Sh- shalane flanagan and uh i've heard you say that you know there was that tweet that shalane put out which was endurance equals speed keep it simple scientist <laughs> yeah yeah so anyway so clearly she's my daughter and i think and this is very typical is that we see uh athletes will can set PBs during a high volume period when they're really not doing that much high intensity work. You know, a little goes a long way and they have fresh legs or, you know, well, not even, they may not even say they have fresh legs. They may even say, I'm kind of tired, but I'm just fit, you know? And that's kind of what my daughter's been saying is, look, I felt kind of tired, but I just, you know, the speed is there. 
And, and I see that a lot with the, the athletes is that during volume periods, they can actually perform very well. So the effect of the high intensity is it is important. It is absolutely part of the recipe, but it's surprising how little you need to top off the tank. Yeah. So in, in terms of that zoning that you've referenced, you know, I like a simple approach can you just put listeners that still aren't quite, you know, grasping the zone one, two, three, in simplest terms, Stephen, in the picture as to, you know, what these zones mean and the demarcation between them and how a, an athlete without access to lactate testing or laboratory work might be able to make sense of trying to discover their their demarcations of these zones for their own training. Yeah, and this is the this is the, the critical question because I know everybody can't get into a laboratory. I've, I've got to be honest. This is a this is a proviso right from the start. Is look, if I can't measure it, then I'm giving you some good rules of thumb that you're going to have to tweak a little bit on your own. But for that first intensity zone, this green zone, what should we see? What should we feel? Well, typically you're going to see and feel that your heart rate in these runs is under 75% of max. So already then you need to think, hmm, do I know my maximum heart rate? So that's one of the calibration points that an endurance athlete needs to know, and you don't need a laboratory to find it, and that is what is your actual maximal heart rate when cycling, when running, when swimming, you know, because they're different for the different modalities. So know your, find out what your maximum heart rate is. And then if you know that, then we've at least got a reasonable starting point for making some reasonable guesses on intensity. And, and going back to the low intensity, typically, like for example, if we go, you know, most well-trained runners, well-trained cyclists, when they're doing a long session, they will be around 70% heart rate max. They may be as low as 65, they may be as high as 72, three or four, but that's about where they'll be. They won't be at 85. They won't be at 80% of max when they're doing a long, easy ride. But I guarantee you, most endurance you know, age groupers, if they're doing an hour, hour and a half ride, they're at 85% and that's too high. If, if the goal is low, to do a low-intensity session. You know, that, that would be my first rule of thumb. Got it. And to calculate that maximum heart rate, I mean, the common adage is 220 minus, you know, uh, someone's age, biological age. That yeah. isn't always uh, accurate. True? That is exactly true. In fact, it is more than likely not right <laughs> for you yeah. as an individual. Because the 220 minus age or 207 minus 0.6 times age, that's another one, they are population estimates. So they're based on a regression equation, meaning you know a statistical line being drawn around through a hundreds of data points. And you fit that line so that it gives you the so-called best fit. And then you get an equation like 207 minus 0.6 times age. And it it's reasonable. But at the individual level, there is just huge variation around that line. So for example, I, I've got data um, from about 100 age group cyclists that we've, we've had in the lab in the last couple of big studies in total. On average, those equations work pretty well. But for the individual, they can be as much as 20 beats per minute off. And it's, you know, a big percentage of the riders, they're 10 beats or more off. And that's a lot. That's, you know, that's going to be enough of an error to pretty much ruin your intensity calculations. If you're guessing 220 minus age, let's say you say, well, I'm 40, 220 minus age is 180. My maximum heart rate is 180. But in reality, your maximum heart rate is 170. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do? You're going to end up riding too hard. You're going to go too hard on easy days. You're going to go too hard on threshold days, and you're going to cook yourself. Uh, and this is very common. Yeah, so it's so important to get that right. So to get it right, 
heart rate monitor on, which are readily available uh, in, in many ways today with technology and go and do what, a, a time trial effort or anything you'd specifically recommend? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you what works for me. Those hours of power give me a pretty darn good. <laughs> but uh, in general, what I would say is go out, do a nice warm up. Now, temperature, body temperature is important. Your core temperature needs to have time to warm up. So the warm up is important. You, you need to spend a good 20 minutes just low intensity riding, getting your temperature, uh, you know, you're literally getting warming up, getting your core temperature up. And then you would do some 30 second uh, higher intensity bounce to kind of turn on your, your metabolic system. So this is part of a good typical warm up anyway. And then probably what I would do is kind of use an interval based approach where I'd say, all right, I'm going to do. I'm going to do find a long hill that I can either run or cycle up, and I'm going to think about doing you know three of those and build it so that the first one is at about you know 85 percent, the second one is about 90, and then that third one you go all out. So now you kind of built in a good warm up, you've got some fatigue going and you're going to mobilize and, and then you push it all the way over the top and see what, and then say, all right, that heart rate I hit at the end of that third interval should be pretty close to uh, my peak heart rate for cycling or for running, whichever. Running, running will tend to be, that is your true max heart rate, but cycling tends to be a bit lower. Your, your peak cycling heart rate will tend to be a few beats lower than your peak running heart rate. Um, so, so that's the way I would approach it is you cook, in, cook this into a workout. And do you prefer to use the term peak heart rate than max to just differentiate, you know, based the fact that running might give you the max, but cycling might give you a peak, which is a few beats below the max. Is that the difference? Yeah, I'm kind of being true to the physiology yeah. club here. <laughs> and that is the true heart rate max is that it's only one number. And it's only, yeah. you know, and typically running will get you there, yeah. running up a hill, <laughs> not flat. You, you, you'll have to run up a hill to get to true max heart rate usually. Yeah. Um, or run on an incline in, on your treadmill. That's a good way to do it as well, because then the hill is as long as you need it to be. <laughs> so if you've got got a hit, you know, a, a treadmill with, you know, that can take you up to good speeds and take you up to 10% grade, then use the treadmill. Um, but if not, then you find that long hill. Yeah. And and then cycling will tend to be a bit lower. So that's why, you know, to be true to, you know, the the terminology we tend to say heart rate peak is the highest heart rate in the modality that you're working like swimming or uh, cycling or you know kayak paddling or whatever and then true max is that's that's max and that generally is running got it and uphill so zone one less than 75 percent of heart rate max if we're talking about running or heart rate peak if it's perhaps one of the other modalities uh zone two what's the demarcation between zone one and zone two zone one the green where we want to spend you know say 80 percent of our uh, the distribution of the minutes of our training zone two yellow uh the nadar i guess of the uh the nike swoosh What's going on between uh, zone one and zone two? Well, zone one and zone two, again, as soon as you get past the, the, the very typical, you know, if I were going to guess a heart rate that demarcates one and two, it'll often be around somewhere between 75 and 78 or 9 percent of max. We'll see that lactate starts to climb. You know, again, that's just a that's an average so your value may vary. But once we get into that zone, then you're, you'll start to see that if you're at a steady state, let's say uh, I can use myself as an example, um, 220, 230 probably watts for me is right on that border zone one, zone two. Uh, where I, I can go zone, I can go 220, 230 watts for a couple hours, two and a half hours, not a big, you know, and it's doable and, and I stay low. But as soon as I get around 240, 250, that's threshold work for me. And now the difference between those two, between 220 and 250, is that at 220 watts, my heart rate will stay flat for quite a long time. Okay. 
But at 250, it'll gradually climb. So this is another one of those key, you know, you can see is if you are really in zone one, you should be able to see that from about 15 minutes in, now that your heart, you know, that your core is warmed up to an hour or 70 minutes or 90 minutes in, your heart rate should not change much at all at that speed or at that power. If that's true, then it's a good indicator that you're actually in zone one. Mm, that you're truly there. And uh, I heard you also reference that you know you truly have had a zone one training session when you get to the end of the session and you are looking for the fridge. You are looking to eat. <laughs> yeah, that's it's you know it's not an absolute, but <laughs> if you have triggered that stress response, then you will tend to feel kind of empty and you're just ready to fill the tank. But if you have triggered that that sympathetic stress response, often you'll also have a period of appetite suppression. And, and all of us that have done interval sessions know that, it, you know, you don't just sit down at the dinner table right after an interval session. You're just not, at least not many people I know can do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's physiology. That's because that, you know, the interval session, we've triggered this big sympathetic response. We've moved blood away from the stomach and, and food. We're just not, it takes a while to get back into a, a state where we're, uh, you know, the brain is saying, okay, now it's time to eat. Yeah. So that's the indicator that we can use and say, hey, if I feel empty, if my heart rate stayed flat during the ride or the run, then, hey, I think I nailed it. I think I was disciplined. I kept intensity where it needed to be. Good on me, you know. And then these zone two sessions, you'll see the creep, of the you know, the slide upward of heart rate. And then, of course, if you're doing interval sessions, high intensity in zone three, then heart rate just keeps climbing. That's that's a hallmark of hard interval sessions or steady state at high intensity. Is heart rate just doesn't flatten out. Yeah, there's no uh, no con- stabilization of that. And in the and in terms of lactate, what's there's the flooding of lactate between zone two and zone zone three, the demarcation. Uh, once you go above above zone zone two is that correct yeah we typically say that between two and three in zone two blood lactate increases that means that the lactate that's being produced inside the muscle cells is no longer able to be consumed inside the cells it starts leaking out into the system and the system in zone two is able to uh, eliminate it at the same rate it's being produced so, for example, blood, the you know, lactate is is coming out of muscle fibers where it's being produced. It's going into the bloodstream. It's being used by the heart. It can be absorbed by the liver. It can be used by other muscles. And you get you you reestablish equilibrium at a little bit higher level. So now your blood lactate is say three millimolar instead of one, but it stabilizes. That will happen in zone two if you're stable in that intensity. But once you cross that second threshold, now you're in a situation where the rate of of production of lactate exceeds the maximum rate of removal. So you cross that maximum lactate steady state. You've heard of that term. That's another term that gets used. So when you do these 60 minute FTP tests, for example, that's a pretty good indicator of what your maximum lactate steady state is. When you cross that divide, you know, <laughs> you cross the Rubicon, then blood lactate is going to just keep accumulating, heart rate's going to keep increasing, and, and eventually you're going to say, I quit. That's enough. Too much. And that's uh and that's you being cooked <laughs> for the session, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and so that's part of the art of devising interval sessions is to, to you know, eventually you're going to get cooked. But I, if, I, if I'm prescribing a session and my goal is for them to get 30 or 40 minutes of work, then i got to make sure that, you know, the intensity doesn't get so high that they, they uh, quit a lot earlier than I expect them to, you know, because I, I want them to accumulate some, some minutes at that 90% range, you know, 90, 92, where it feels hard, but they're not falling apart. You know, the first 
batch of uh, say five by eight minutes going so hard that the second, third, fourth, fifth uh, reps are are terrible and they they're quitting. <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. So that's and that's the prescription that we give. Uh, I use is look. I will prescribe the the let's say four times eight. I say to the athlete, you're going to do four times eight minutes. You're going to have two minute recovery between, which you can use as you wish, meaning you can either jog slowly or you you know you decide. And I want you to have the goal of holding the average for those four interval bouts as high as you manage. It, you know, it's a, it's not racing; it's a training session. But your goal is not to fly and die. Your goal is to be able to hold power for those four times eight. So this is the conversation you have to have between brain and body and, and find that, you know, pace yourself. And, and that's usually what happens is it, it's quite impressive that athletes are pretty quick to find that power that they can sustain. Mm, I like that. Don't fly and die, hold power. That's right. Keep it simple, scientists. <laughs> Obviously, that's good training for a race as well. The reason I use five times eight, one of the reasons I use it with my daughter is because it's a very good indicator of what her 10K race speed is going to be. You know, if you think about it, that makes sense. You're collecting 40 minutes of running. Yep. And her 10K is a bit less than 40 minutes, so so uh, those should match up pretty well. And you're learning to feel that race pace and, you know, the associated adaptations. That's right. And you're learning also not to go out too hard because that is uh, – even I learned when I was in high school running the 400 meter, if you go out one second too hard in the first half, you're going to pay two seconds in the second half. <laughs> yeah. And that's – that's kind of the rule of thumb still for endurance. So when you go out too hard early, you pay double in the end. So your advice to your daughter lining up for a half marathon chasing a PB or PR in terms of pacing is what? Uh, we, you know, well, she's only done one half marathon and it went pretty well. She went 123. Um, it wasn't a flat course. It was kind of hilly. But I just said to her, look, you know, the first 5K, you want to hold back a little bit. You want to, you know, ease into it. And, and then what I knew is that if she eased into it, her actual speed would be, you know, right where it needed to be. Because mentally, those first 5K feel easy. Mm. So athletes tend to go too fast. They th- and they feel great. But then, then it catches up with them. So you almost have to trick yourself, you know, or trick your athlete and say, all right, keep it slow in the first 5K. Well, you know they're not actually going to be slow, but they're going to at least mentally try, you're trying to get them in a state where they're holding back a bit. A bit. And, and that will give dividends in the last five, to, you know, five, five to 10K. You're listening to Dr. Stephen Seiler, acclaimed sports scientist on all things optimizing training and the polarized training method. If you missed last week's episode, it was an expert edition featuring the kettlebell physio, Neil May. It was a deep dive into all things resistance training with kettlebells. Here's a little snippet of what you missed. 20 odd years of training old school barbell and left it behind and since the end of 2012 beginning of 2013 I've done literally nothing but kettlebell training and bodyweight training ever since and off the back of that and, and, and this interest I thought this is an amazing tool I can see the clinical value in it and I'm going to use it in a, in a business to tune into the full episode featuring Neil May jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from and take notes while there peruse the archives of the show dating right back to episode one with featured performer surf life saving Ironman champion Ali Day for now let's jump back on this expert edition with Dr. Stephen Siler. Stephen, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, Every guest of the Physical Performance Show issues a physical challenge to listeners for the week. So what is Stephen Siler's physical challenge of the week going to be? All right, so I thought about this, and and I decided that here's my challenge. It's at least consistent with what I've been saying. Is my challenge to your audience this week is that whatever 
their longest planned workout was, whether it was a ride or a run uh, or what have you, I want them to increase it by 25% or 30 minutes, whichever is the bigger value. So I want them to stretch their longest easy run or ride by 25% or 30 minutes and, and keep the intensity low, keep it, you know, keep it cool, but just stretch, stretch it, stretch it. And is this for one week or for a whole season? Well, let's do one week and see how that goes. But I think what you'll find or what your audience will find is that when they succeed in that, it's going to feel pretty darn good and it's going to open up their mind to, the idea of that horizontal stretch that also is part of, you know, creating a bigger training stimuli, not just intensity. Yeah, brilliant. And and briefly, physiologically, the adaptations taking place in this zone one stretching out of the session by 25% or 30 minutes, what are the top couple of uh, physiological adaptations endurance athletes are experiencing? Well, we're going to push them probably out of their comfort zone and, and they're going to be recruiting more you know, muscle that they tend to not recruit on the low intensity sessions. They're going to be, you know, those, those type one slow twitch fibers are going to start getting fatigued and they're going to start recruiting perhaps some of those type two fibers. And, and so we're going to try to get them start a process of extending the time that they can stay in a nice, flat, steady state in zone one. And and hopefully we're going to see also that their heart rate is going to, it, it probably is going to sneak up a bit on them when they, when they extend the time at first, but hopefully that'll flatten out. Brilliant. And Stephen, if you could boil everything from your, you know, uh, world leading research, your, your uh, academic acclaim down to one piece of advice, just one solitary piece of advice to help listeners of this show perform at their best what would that one piece of advice be? Uh, yeah, I find that to be the worst question in the history of podcasting. Uh, that is so difficult. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you really uh, you hurt. You're hurting me on this one. <sighs> the one solitary piece of advice I would give to to people is keep easy, low intensity sessions low. Keep the hard hard and trust the plan. Plan your work, work your plan. Plan your work, work your plan. Keep the low intensity low and the hard or high high. That's right. And if you manage that, uh, a lot of good things can happen. Gosh, Dr. Stephen Seiler, thank you for your expertise, your contribution to not only the scientific literature but the training habits of you know athletes worldwide, health professionals like myself who have uh, learnt and continue to learn so much from you. So thank you for your, your greater contribution. Of course, thank you for your contribution to this episode of the Physical Performance Show. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust and I hope and I know that you enjoyed the sharings of today's featured guest, acclaimed sports scientist, Dr. Stephen Seiler. Wow, there was so much there. I took notes on notes when I recorded the interview originally, and I'm sure you have as well. Now, if you know someone in your world your training world, your training group, who would benefit from the teachings and the knowledge that Dr. Stephen Siler has shared today, then please, please, please share this episode with them. Be sure to also jump over to the show notes on pogophysio.com.au where we are linking up some of Stephen's great YouTube presentations and also published literature from his ResearchGate profile. So jump over to pogophysio.com.au to easily access links that relate to Dr. Siler's work. Also consider letting Stephen know what it was that you enjoyed or took away from today's episode or perhaps pose a question for Stephen. You'll find Dr. Siler over on Twitter at Stephen Siler, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, 
S-E-I-L-E-R. Please do keep the podsies coming. They are screenshots of the episode that you are enjoying at any given moment and simply tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show over on Instagram, plus or minus myself at Brad underscore beer on Instagram as well. They are a whole lot of fun and it's really rewarding and encouraging to see so many of you enjoying the episodes as they go live each and every Thursday. Hitting subscribe is the best way to help the show grow and that's something something that I absolutely am thrilled by. And perhaps the threshold, we're talking about intensity thresholds today, is four episodes. If you've enjoyed four episodes, then please consider hitting subscribe, which will ensure that the episodes land in your earbuds each and every Thursday as they go live. And of course, it also helps this show grow. And having just crossed the threshold of 600,000 iTunes downloads, the show really is on the move. And it's a big thanks to the good folk like yourself who have been tuning in. So massive thank you. Thank you also for those that have taken time to leave reviews over on iTunes. A big thanks this week to Jess Willis. Jess has commented, I don't listen to many podcasts, but I'm continually impressed with the Physica Performance Show. The interview techniques really get knowledge and information out of the people being interviewed. And it also is done in a way that people of all fitness and performance levels can understand and relate to. I've picked up some really great tips on improving not only my performance, but my general well-being as well. Please keep them coming. Jess, thank you for the five-star review and also the comments. They really are rocket fuel to bring in you what is hopefully great content. So thank you. As always, a massive thanks to the good folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, Matthew Walding on all things graphic design, and Oliver Crossley on some behind-the-scenes contributions. Of course, another huge thanks to today's show sponsor, Physiocram. Podcasts are free to download, however, they are not free to produce, so Physiocram support goes a huge way in bringing this to you. Don't forget to take up the Physiocram offer, 20% off any product over at physiocram.com.au. Now, coming up on next week's episode, episode 173 of the Physica Performance Show, we keep this expert edition theme going. I'm really excited next week to share with you a conversation that I recently had with sports psychologist Dr. Joe Lukens. Dr. Joe Lukens has over 25 years of clinical psychology experience working with individuals, some of Australia's great sporting teams, including the premiership winning North Queensland Cowboys rugby league team and organisations. Dr. Joe has been described as a modern day psychological Indiana Jones. And Dr. Joe has recently released a fantastic publication by way of a book titled The Elite, Think Like an Athlete, Succeed Like a Champion, 10 Things the Elite Do Differently. It has a terrific foreword by Jonathan Thurston. And next week on the Physical Performance Show, we take a deep dive into what some of those 10 things that the elite do differently psychologically are. So be sure to be tuning in next week to the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. <laughs>